We all know that genetics play a role in our success of almost all endeavours. So how much do our genetics influence our ability to grow muscle mass? To answer this question, we first need to understand what exactly genetics are. Now, I should first start by mentioning that I am not an expert in this field, so I won't be going into too much detail on this particular section. Rather, this video will more so look at the influence of genetics on muscle growth. So, as a very general overview, genetics are the organisms which basically tell our cells what to do. So our genes provide the instructions for the body to perform a function. Our genetics determine almost all characteristics of our current being. This can be obvious things such as our hair colour or height, but it can also be more discrete things such as our blood type or risk of certain diseases. We don't really need to go into any more detail about genetics for this video, we just need to understand that genetics heavily influence our current state and how we respond to stresses. However, genetics don't determine absolutely everything. We can modify our characteristics with different stresses. Our bodies can adapt and become more resilient in many different ways. For example, resistance training can be used to grow bigger muscles. So while our genetics provide a baseline to start with, what we do in our lives will determine where we take this baseline level. So pretty much everyone can grow muscle mass, although our genetics may determine how much or how fast we grow. But it should just be understood that genetics don't determine absolutely everything. So how much of a role do genetics play? Well, according to this textbook, genetics only differ by around 0.1% between all humans on Earth. So this should mean that we are all basically the same and we should all respond pretty much the same to training, right? Well, unfortunately not. While our genetics are mostly similar, this probably more so accounts for factors like our ability to breathe, circulate blood around the body, the ability to digest food, and many more essential bodily functions. Our individual response to resistance training is probably such a small and insignificant part of our genetic makeup that it probably falls within this 0.1% of individual variation. So let's now explore which variables our genetics determine that cannot be modified. These are things that we are born with and can't change through training and nutrition interventions. The first is our bone structure. This refers to the shape and size of our skeleton. Our bone structure determines things like our height, limb lengths, shoulder and hip width, and how all of this looks relative to each other. I think this is an often underappreciated factor which has quite a major influence on our physique. Our bone structure will influence our physique in two primary ways. First, it will play a large role in determining the maximum amount of muscle your body can carry. Simply put, a bigger bone structure means there is more room for muscle to be built. For example, a lifter with broader shoulders and a larger rib cage will be able to pack on more chest, upper back and shoulder muscle mass than someone of the same height with a smaller structure. So ultimately, our bone structure provides the framework for muscle to be built upon. And the other way our bone structure will influence our physique is not directly related to muscle growth, but more so about proportions. This refers to how different body parts look relative to each other. For example, if someone has broader shoulders relative to their hips, they will probably look more upper body dominant. Or if a lifter has small ankle and knee joints relative to their hips, they may appear to have smaller calves relative to their quads, hamstrings and glutes. So, while everyone can build more muscle mass than what they currently have, our bone structure will determine how much muscle can be built to some extent, and how this looks as an overall package on our physique. The next genetic factor that we cannot change, without surgery at least, is the shape of our muscles. Although we all have the same general anatomical structure, each muscle will look slightly different on each person. This is due to several factors, including our bone structure, like we just discussed. However, we also have other variations in our muscles which can determine their specific shape. One factor influencing this is our muscle attachment sites. It is quite common for each person to have slightly different attachment sites on their skeleton, meaning the muscle may look slightly different for each person. For example, this study explored the individual variation of muscle attachment sites on the clavicle, also known as the collarbone, in 14 different people. This diagram shows a visual depiction of the areas of different muscle attachments on the clavicle, 
and how prevalent the attachment sites were. As we can see, while the various muscles are all attached in similar positions, there is certainly some individual variation. For example, this muscle mostly attached around this area here, but it could have attached around here for some people and here for others, which can make a difference of several centimeters. While this may not sound like a major difference, it can have quite a substantial influence on how the muscle structure appears. Furthermore, trainees can also have significant differences in muscle fiber orientation, which will also influence its shape and appearance. For example, this study looked at the anatomical variations of the pec major muscle. As we can see, different people have different looking muscles, not only because of differences in bone structure and attachment sites, but also because of fiber orientation. For example, this person has a clear separation of the clavicular head of the pec, while this individual has a more fan-shaped pec muscle with no visible upper pec separation. And the last major unmodifiable factor related to muscle growth is our response to training. While we have complete control over what training we actually perform, we can't determine how we respond to this stimulus. Ultimately, the adaptation process is out of our control. For example, if we took a sample of random people and put them all through the same training and nutrition protocol for one year, we will likely see a range of different responses. Chances are everyone would see decent muscle growth, assuming the training and nutrition practices were effective, but some people would see more or less growth. Most people will probably see reasonable growth, but some would see far less growth than others, and some would see far greater growth than the average. It has even been proposed that our genetic response to training may even be more impactful than the resistance training intervention itself. This study explored correlations between genetic muscle characteristics and hypertrophy through resistance training. Although I wasn't able to access the full article to look at the exact procedures, the researchers concluded that intrinsic biological factors were highly predictive of how much muscle the trainees grew. So, although there are genetic differences determining muscle growth and physique development, there are also many factors which we can modify. Quite clearly, we have full control over our training and nutrition practices, which obviously have a significant effect on muscle growth too. However, the interesting thing is that each person tends to respond differently to different training interventions. When we look at research, they usually just report the average findings, without consideration for how different people responded. However, in reality, people tend to actually respond quite differently to different training methods. As an example, this study explored the individual responses to different training frequencies. Trainees performed single leg leg extensions five times per week with one leg, and only two to three times per week with the other leg. It was found that each trainee saw different results with the different training frequencies. For example, this trainee saw greater quad growth in the leg trained with a higher frequency compared with the leg that was trained with a lower frequency, while this trainee saw greater muscle growth in the leg being trained with a lower frequency compared with a higher frequency. What this suggests is that you as an individual may respond better or worse to different styles of training. While it is probably a good idea to start with what works best for most people on average, over time, you probably want to individualize your training routine to what seems to have the best effect specifically for yourself. So in some cases, you might think that you respond poorly to resistance training, but maybe you just need to try a few different training methods to find what works best. This is not something you can do by trying a training style once or twice and concluding that it isn't viable for you. Rather, this will be a long process where we should continue to seek the most effective training methods over an entire lifting career. This also brings up the idea of what we call non-responders, also commonly referred to as hard gainers. These are those people that seem to just not be able to build any appreciable amount of muscle. They may do the same training as others, but just don't get the same out of it as most people. However, there is probably no such thing as true non-responders, meaning those who simply do not see any adaptation from training. Instead, like we have discussed, the magnitude of hypertrophy from any given training intervention will be variable from person to person. This research review suggested that the term non-responder is probably just an exaggerated term for those who don't seem to respond as well to common training interventions. And rather than simply thinking you don't respond well, 
you might actually see a much better response by simply trying a different training program. Oftentimes, typical hard gainers are usually just people who need much more volume than typical trainees to see significant growth. This leads us onto the idea of where exactly does our genetic potential lie? How will I respond to this form of training? How much muscle can I actually build? These are all questions that nobody really knows the answer to. We don't know what our response to training will be until we actually try. And even then, we don't know how we will respond to a different training protocol until we try. And for the most part, we will probably never reach our true genetic limits in our lifetime. From what we know, muscle growth is an adaptation that can continue to improve over a long time. There are many trainees who have continued to make hypertrophy gains for multiple decades with consistent training. And those who see negative physique changes over time can usually be attributed to poorer training and nutrition practices, not just because they got older. So until you train effectively and consistently for multiple decades and continually strive to individualize your training routine, you won't even know what your true genetic potential is. And this brings us to the most important point of this video. Do our genetics even matter? Does it really matter if we have good or bad muscle building genetics? The answer to this is probably not. This is because of two primary reasons. First is that we ultimately can't change our genetics. We just need to make the most of what we are given. There is no real point trying to find reasons why our genetics might be worse than others because that simply doesn't change the outcome of what we are trying to achieve. And the other more important reason why our genetics don't really matter is because everyone has the ability to improve their physique from where they currently are. Lifting, in my opinion at least, is not about comparing yourself to others or trying to be better than others, it is more about improving your own physique. I generally believe that lifting, or any other recreational exercise for that matter, should be something that enhances the quality of your life, not something that degrades it. And the good thing is, no matter what your genetics are, lifting has the ability to promote self-improvement. So, to summarize this video, let's establish some practical recommendations. Genetics can certainly influence muscle growth and physique development. A genetics will determine our bone structure, muscle shape, and our response to resistance training, which are inherent characteristics that we cannot modify. However, there are differences in how each trainee responds to different training protocols. Some trainees may see better results from one routine, while others may see better results from a different routine. So you can't really conclude how good or bad your genetics are until you actually put the time and effort into training over decades. And even then, regardless of how good or bad your genetics are, they aren't really that important for what positive things lifting does for our life. Regardless of our genetics, we can all improve to some extent over time and use this as a tool for self-improvement. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.